This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at asm.org slash twim. This is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode 210, recorded on November 25th, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Small Things Considered, Elio Schechter. Well, hello, everyone. How's California? Is it still burning? It, it's still burning in parts. Uh, it's not as bad as it was, but it's it's pretty bad still. Do you have blackouts? Uh, not what I am, no. No, you're okay. All right. And you don't have any fires down there in San Diego area? No, not, not close. Not, not good. really. That's good. Also joining us from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. And life is just peachy here in the Midwest. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I'm sure it is. And from the Medical University of South Carolina, which is in Charleston, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Is life peachy for you too? Life is always peachy. We we import them from Georgia when we run out. <laughs> <laughs> Not too far from you. Not too far from us. But peach season is over. Peach season's over. Well, a twim season is not. There is nope. no twim season. Twim is uh, all year round. And if you like twim season, please consider supporting us financially. Microbe.tv slash contribute. We'll have more about that later. I have a couple of interesting follow-up emails. Uh, follow-up means um, they have to do with recent things. And the first is from Richard, who writes, Dear Professors, I'm a huge fan of all your programs, but I have to take exception to a comment you made in last week's TWIM that medicine is a training program and a PhD is an education. I said that when we were in Georgia. It was What was that, 209? Is that right? There was. So that was the last episode, yeah. My undergraduate degrees were in molecular biology and biochemistry. I then went to medical school and then began a PhD program in molecular biology at the Fred Hutchison Cancer Research Center and found that my medical school education was superior to any other teaching I have ever received in any area. I have done a bit of science on the side during my career as a practicing physician, and science is my religion, philosophy, and worldview. I live by the principle of falsifiability. Any physician who is worth his salt is at least in part a scientist. And I just want to pause and say, I hope not. I'll get back to that later. Any physician who cannot read a scientific article should not be a physician. I've attached my publications in hope that you think they qualify as science. I am no David Baltimore, but have tried to make a small contribution. I've heard the argument that surgeons are mere mechanics. But the process of operating with my hands was a great joy, and I had the privilege of operating with the great Bill DeVries, who put the first artificial heart in a human, and central to this procedure is the underlying science of the clotting of our blood, which we have yet to completely figure out. I have also repeatedly heard the put-down that medical school is only rote memorization, but would you not call the first anatomists scientists? You can't possibly hope to understand processes going on in an environment if you are not even familiar with the landscape. Incidentally, I find the dissection of scientific papers the best part of your podcast, and I would like to hear that on This Week in Parasitism as well. Many thanks for the great effort you put into these shows. Rich Witten, MD. All right, so the easy part first. TWIP, we do papers, and perhaps not in as much detail, but we have case studies instead, and uh, we spend a lot of time on those. Well, I, I appreciate your view, Rich. It sounds like you had more science in your education than me most medical students, and there are always exceptions. But I speak from my experience teaching medical students here at Columbia, interacting with physicians who are wonderful and they save lives, but I, I sense very little of the understanding of the underlying science of what they are doing. For example, if I once asked a physician, if he knew how a cycle of your work, he had no idea how it inhibited herpes simplex virus. Now, I'm sure you do, but there, as I said, there are some physicians who go beyond and get a better uh, scientific education. And the reason I point out that 
you know, physicians should be a, a scientist is that you do not so – scientists do experiments. And I don't want a physician doing an experiment unless you're volunteering for a clinical trial, of course. So that's something totally different. And my father was a surgeon and he knew very little science, although he was a really good surgeon. So that's why I say that. I think as a, med, as a physician, you are trained to react to situations and that's a training. You see symptoms and signs. This is what it is and we will try and fix it. And that's the way it should be. I don't mean to be um, insulting in any way. And so you may have got something different, and there are many other MD-PhDs that will get something different as well. But I think uh, medicine uh, physicians, uh, for the most part, are reacting uh, to what they see based on training. You know, I teach medical students, and they have no interest in whether poliovirus is a plus or minus strand RNA virus, even though that helps you understand how the virus replicates. I've always struggled, unless you engage them clinically— and unless they have a special interest in clinical research, it's hard to engage them in the basic science. That's my personal uh, experience, and that's why I made that statement. And I also teach medical students, and I think I see them in the first or early in the second year. And the reality is there is just an enormous amount of foundational knowledge they have to assimilate so that then they can do the pow use their powers of observation and recognizing patterns and deduction um, to kind of advance advance their the field of medicine. So I'm not sure my view of the first and second year students really is an accurate reflection of, of what a a uh, skilled physician does in their day to day, mm. but but you're right. I, they don't. They shouldn't be doing experiments. And and frankly, I'll also say there are plenty of scientists who use a particular reagent or an assay or a machine, and they don't understand how it works, but they know it's effective. I mean, there's only so much time in a day, so you do have to be somewhat pragmatic. But I think that also a lot of what um, medical students learn is. is exclusively to pass the boards and then that's it. They forget yeah. about most of it and they mm. focus on their specialty, whatever it may be. Right. Right. That's just the way it is. At least in the years that we all see them. Yeah. I too right. teach med students and we see the year ones, the year twos, and they're trying to get through the very important step one of USMLE mm -hmm. and it determines their future. That score on step one actually determines along with their uh, grades and their letters of recommendation, determine ultimately where they'll go for residency. And they, all physicians trained in the U.S., have to do a residency. And so that's why they're so focused on getting through boards. It's not that they're not curious. It's not that they don't have this desire to know how stuff works. It's just simply – they're very focused on their futures. Yep. Pragmatic. Pragmatic. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, but thank goodness that we do have MD PhD programs to try to foster mm -hmm. uh, people who do and protect time so that people can both do the clinical work and then bring it back to the lab and inform the rest of us who don't have that clinical expertise. You know, we're in here addition, the real In addition, these programs select, select for some of the very best. And by the way, they are called clinician scientists. Yes. Not just clinicians. There you go. Mm -hmm. All right. One more from Andy. Andy won Spore last time or the time before, maybe. I can't remember. And he writes, I just got around to finishing listening to him episode 209, which must have been the last one we did on Skype. So 208 must be Georgia. It was. 209 this morning on my way to work. I was very gratified to find that fate chose me to win the Spore book. According to Dr. Schmidt, my employer must be one of the better ones since we have a library where I will donate the book after I have a go at understanding some of it. This was my first time writing and trying to win something. Maybe this is my reward for catching <laughs> up on TWIM over the past two years or so. Twivo got me into Twix. I've kept up on Twivo and started at the beginning of both TWIM and TWIP but was falling further behind current, so I concentrated on TWIM until I can now sometimes eagerly await your next episode. <laughs> what about TWIV? I guessed when I started this that TWIV would be ultimately the most interesting to me, but also the most challenging to grasp. I'm about to start TWIV at the beginning soon. Please pray for me. Oh, he's <laughs> got to go through 500-plus episodes. 
He's going to need prayers. 575. I'm excited to get a look at the book. Thanks for that, but especially thanks for the education and entertainment you and your friends have provided me and so many others, and a big preemptive thanks for all that's to come. All right, Andy, enjoy that book. should have it by now. I have a snippet for everyone today, which is slightly different. And And I'm on the edge of my seat because you said it's a surprise. It's a surprise. Michelle doesn't know. Nobody knows. And Michael, you're going to know this very quickly, but hold back, okay? I I will. You you probably have seen the picture and you know what's going on here. All right. So this is from my trip to Sweden back in August. I went to Stockholm and then Schmugen to do a couple of podcasts. Normally when I travel, I don't do anything. I go, I do my work and I come home and never look at anything. But I went to Stockholm and I had met a TWIV listener, Agnes, at a previous meeting in Europe in Rotterdam. And she is a clinical microbiologist. And she said, if you ever come to Sweden, I'll show you around. So when I got to Stockholm, uh, she showed me around Stockholm. But then uh, we drove to Smugen, which is about six hours west and so, wow. so it was her and Erling Norby, who was uh, one of my TWIV guests, and she would stop every hour or so and show us stuff. And at one point, she stopped at a place called Varnum Abbey, V-A-R-N-H-E-M. And it was a pretty church, and um, they wanted to go in, so okay, I go in. This was an abbey... Uh, It was founded in 1150, and the land had been given to the monks by a wealthy woman by the name of Sigrid, and the church was begun in Romanesque style, was badly damaged in a fire in 1234, and then was completed in early Gothic style. The nave, the main aisle, was divided into sections for different groups in the abbey, was consecrated in 1260 as the largest church in Sweden at the time. Along came the Reformation, which led to the closure of monasteries, and this uh, abbey was abandoned in 1533 and left to decay. I can't wait to hear how this connects to microbiology. It will. It will. (laughs) So after that, it was restored in the 17th century. We don't need to hear about that because our story happens earlier. So I go into this uh, church, um, this uh, well, it's, a, it's now a church. People go there. Uh, it's a parish church for the little town of Varnum. It gets a lot of visitors also because it's quite old. I think it's the oldest church in Sweden. Um, and uh, I, so I go in, I walk around, and in the back, uh, near the entrance, I see a little glass box with, with an artifact in it. And I'm looking at it, and I go, oh, my goodness, Michael is going to like this. <laughs> and it's it's a box with a um, with a humerus in it. It's a bone, and it has a little um, a little page of information, which is written by Bo Nr, who is an associate professor in the Department of Orthopedics at Skovd Hospital in Sweden. So let me read some of this. I'll paraphrase it. Uh, during the fifth dynasty, the ancient Egyptians already knew how to treat fractures with a splint. Hippocrates also described this. Open surgical treatment of fractures did not become a common treatment until the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century. There are no signs of open osteosynthesis before the 19th century, as I'm aware of. So osteosynthesis would be someone has a broken bone. You open up and you put metal or wire or screws in to help fix it. That's called osteosynthesis. In the year 1928, there was an interesting finding close to the old Varnham Monastery in the Billingen Mountain Heights, an almost intact left humerus from a man which showed signs of advanced surgery. Through archaeological and historical calculations, the conclusion was that the bone had been buried sometime between the year 1260 and 1527. Exact dating was impossible to determine because a C14 calculation needs at least 100 grams of bone. The humerus, which only weighed 95 grams, would then have been destroyed. It's a substantial piece of bone, as you'll see. Yeah, it I'll, is. I'll put a picture in the show notes. The bone is 24 centimeters long, holds the distal two-thirds of the humerus intact. Wrapped around the middle part is a perfectly matched 10 by 3 by 15 centimeter copper plate. Ah, 
<laughs> three small holes goes through the plate on the connecting sides, and these are supposedly to initially have held the plate together in combination with some kind of wiring. The dimensions of the bone makes it clear that it comes from a man. There's no angular displacement or rotation of the bone. Despite this, the most likely cause for the injury is that an open fracture has occurred. Perhaps the man tried to avoid a stab from an axe or a sword with a shield. This created a soft tissue injury, which made it possible for the surgery and open osteosynthesis with copper plate. Behind the decision of choosing copper plate was probably a medicinal aspect. An analysis has shown that the plate contains very pure copper, 99% copper, 0.5% lead, which has a well-known strong effect against bacteria, which already right. already the Roman doctor A.C. Celsius described. Uh, the sister Sincer monks had, these are the, the monks who started this abbey, had the knowledge and ability to offer advanced medical treatment and based upon knowledge from the ancient times in the Far East, they had probably knowledge about the copper and its antibacterial effect. Uh, bone growth in conjunction with copper shows that the fracture has healed and that the man survived many years after the surgery. Whether the injured arm was in useful shape is not known. It was probably a high-standing person, both for the monastery and the country, which got the monks to do this surgery. It is the oldest open surgery with osteosynthesis known in history. This finding proves more or less that the birth of open fracture surgery happened in Skaraborg, Sweden. And there's an article that describes this, uh, but I couldn't find it. It's in a journal called OSSA, O-S-S-A. And this is a little uh, writing that um, I saw on the box. And there's in the show notes, there's a picture of this bone. So what do you think, Michael? I, I think... <laughs> If he survived that sort of surgery, it, it was probably solely due to the copper because, you know, that big of an incision must have been, uh, you know, just like putting out a box of donuts in the coffee room in the morning <laughs> for bacteria. I mean, it I'm, – I'm surprised he survived because that had to have been pretty traumatic for him. More importantly, how did he survive the pain? Mm, of right. the surgery. Yes. Um, you know, they, they filled, filled him up with Aquavit. I'm sure there was a lot of Aquavit involved. But yeah, that, because, that's absolutely uh, incredible. It's a quite a big piece of copper wrapped around the uh, Yeah, the, the picture, the image is incredible. The, the amount of copper looks to be at least one quarter of the size of the whole bone. Yeah. Oh it's almost like a cuff. Yeah. yeah. So they would have to have wrapped gotten below the bone and so it's a pretty good a pretty big incision to do this so it must have been painful but copper is again very malleable and at 99 yeah. percent pure copper it it's easily foldable and the additional lead in there it facilitates its ductability its mm -hmm. ability to mold around the bone and actually hold it in place and they probably use copper screws to anchor it to the bone which is really no different than some of the surgeries that we see today, except they use stainless steel screws and stainless steel plates in lieu of, of copper. Mm. So this may be something to go back to, to begin to look to see whether or not um, the orthopedist would investigate using copper mm. yeah, because you take them back to the beginning of their discipline back in the 1100s. So, um, this bone is in a glass case at the back of the uh, abbey. It's <laughs> just sitting there waiting for me to find it. And fortunately, wow. I was looking at everything, right? <laughs> um, it was a nice, very nice abbey, but this really got my attention. And I thought this would be a cool snippet. And so it there was. you go. So there you go. I mean, there's no, you know, no science here, but they, you know, they heard that this might be a good thing to put copper in there. So I think it's interesting that. You know, the, the Celsus, the Roman, was much, much more before this. So that information had already spread, right, throughout Europe. Oh, yeah. Europe. The, the utility of copper has, by the human race, is over eight millennia. Yeah. Mm. So we've, we've been using it before we even knew how to write. And we probably have some TWIM episodes that talk more in detail about copper's antimicrobial effects. Huh? Oh, yeah. We, we do indeed. We have Michael's paper, right? Yep, we did an episode on that, and then we've had uh, maybe some others and plenty of emails as well. So yes. I thought this fit in, and it would be cool, and I hope you like it. We'll put a picture of the um, humorous uh, with the copper around it in the show notes, and 
some link to Varnum Abbey. How did I know this would be so cool? <laughs> Yeah, it was just and a, it goes to show we're we're entering the travel holiday season, so uh, just goes to show you just never know what's going to be around the next corner that will inspire you. I mean, or intrigue I, I, you. I mean, I have to say I wasn't so excited about visiting. You know, okay, it's fine. It's really old. And I saw it was really old, so that was mm-hmm. cool. And then, uh, yeah, you never know. So you never know what you're going to uncover. Keep keep an open mind, right? Yep. All right, now we have a real paper, and Michael's going to entertain us with that. <laughs> All right, the title of today's paper from the Journal of Bacteriology is PQS produced by Pseudomonas aeruginosa stress response repels swarms away from bacteriophage and antibiotics. It's by Jean-Louis Brew, Brandon Ra- Rosson, Calvin Trin, Katrin Whitson, Nina Mullen Holen Kroxborough, <laughs> and Albert. I never know what to do with the H and the S and the B when and the pronunciation of that, but hopefully Elio will correct me. And Albert Siriporn from the University of California at Irvine's Departments of Molecular Biology and Biochemistry, Physics and Astronomy, the School of Biological Sciences, and um, Mullen Holen has gone off to the Department of Veterinary Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. So this is a really interesting paper. It's sort of a multimedia extravaganza. There are movies that go along with much of the science associated with the paper, and often you can get to the supplemental section without having to violate the paywall. Uh, Many times you can get to the movies, so the movies are something to see, but as this is in the Journal of Bacteriology, you should be able to see this in six months if you're not a subscriber or have ready access to this journal. You mean you get free access after after six months after it's been published, right? That's right. Free access after six months. By the way, way, one should say that the Journal of Bacteriology has really done – a terrific job recently. It's gotten to be very good, and it's well worth reading. And submitting your papers, too. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. And it comes out twice a month. I just um, was looking for twim titles at one day at lunch, and this paper just caught my eye, and it was just absolutely fascinating as you go through the abstract. And the editors of the Journal of Bacteriology actually solicited a commentary, which is also quite interesting. It it puts it into a bigger perspective than the the discussion of the author. So it's really quite something to see. And that um, commentary is entitled PQS Signaling for More Than a Quorum, the Collective Stress Response Protects Healthy Pseudomonas aeruginosa Populations. And that is also in the Journal of Bacteriology. So the authors start by investigating the effect of a bacteriophage infection on the coordination of swarming in the gram-negative rod Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, this type of – if this sounds bizarre, if you go – It is. It is is bizarre. (laughs) What a strange connection to make. It it, it really is because you don't normally think of pseudomonads swarming. And this type of motility is different than the swim, tumble, swim, tumble approach that many of us think about when thinking about bacterial movement. This is more movement Mm. of a community, and Mm. it's best visualized on a semi-solid agar plate, which you can easily visualize by spotting a wild-type variant of Pseudomonas in the center of the plate, and the plate is composed of 0.5% 0.5% agar rather than the routine 1.5% agar to solidify the matrix. And what happens is that the organism begins to send out these tendrils developing outward from the center. So what you do is you just spot the organism in the middle of the plate and it sort of just creeps out. It's the it's population. Pretty- Population. The population just yep. creeps out because you actually are watching this with your naked eye. And that's why the supplemental movies are so interesting and fascinating to watch 
because while the figures that the authors have in this paper do it justice, the movies bring this science to life. So if you have an opportunity to look at the movies, I encourage you to look at it. The other thing that you should appreciate is that by the time you see the colonies, the microbe is already in maximum stationary phase. You just keep that fact in the back of your mind because it will help mm -hmm. you with some of the thinking about the expression that's going on and how the mechanism of this bizarre behavior is going on. So let's mm -hmm. talk a little bit about swarming. Swarming is a collective form of bacterial motility that's driven jointly by flagella and pili that is thought to promote antibiotic resistance in pathogenesis in humans. In these high cell density bacterial populations swarm on semi-solid surfaces which have physical characteristics similar to those of mucus layers surrounding our epithelial membranes. In particular, semi-solid agar media, like the type that they use here to do their swarming assays of 0.5% agar and mucus are both non-Newtonian fluids that share overlapping ranges of viscosity. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with Newtonian versus non-Newtonian fluids, a Newtonian fluid is one that has a constant viscosity independent of any stressors. Like you, when you pour water, it, it effectively has its same characteristic regardless of the stressors it's under. And similarly, honey is a Newtonian fluid. Uh, Non-Newtonian fluids, viscosity can change when they're under forces to make them either more liquid or more solid. And the best example that I can come up with of a non-Newtonian fluid is ketchup. We all know <laughs> that it flows faster <laughs> subsequent to someone shaking the bottle or banging against their fist. And here in this swarming behavior, in the case of Pseudomonas, the banging of the bo ketchup bottle effect is facilitated by rhamnolipids that are made by the microbe and another molecule that they abbreviate HAA, which is 3,3-hydroxyalkalinyl oxyalkalonic acid. So no we're less. just going to we're no just going to call it HAA. But it's effectively the ketchup bottle effect that these lipids and HAA do to enable Pseudomonas to swarm on a semi-solid plate. So when this robust gram-negative bacterium gets infected by a phage, it stops the swarming motility. Now, if you spot an infected colony in the path of an advancing uninfected swarm of Pseudomonas, as it nears the infected colony, it's akin to oncoming traffic approaching a broken down car in the middle lane of a busy interstate. So you think the most busy road in the state of California's interstate system with the 12 lanes. So you got this broken down car in the middle. That's the phage infected colony. And then the uninfected cells or the drivers in the other cars, if you will, approaching this lane, if they have ways on, Ways is a GPS-enabled thing telling him there's a wreck up up what. The whole flow of traffic veers to the left or right away from the infected phage colony, effectively moving the traffic away from the broken down or infected cell. Which it's is a nice analogy, Michael. Nice it, analogy. It, it really is what's going on. It's just planted there in the middle of the road and say, hey, stay away from me. I'm sick. Uh, you don't want to get what I have. As you can imagine, this behavior has as its consequence of limiting the infection to a subpopulation of the community that is approaching the infected cells, which promotes survival of the overall population and would direct healthy bacteria away from an infected colony 
or the phage contaminated zone because when phage lice cells, they spill their contents out and a typical bacterial phage infection typically dumps about a thousand phage per cell outward. So, you know, it's effectively spilling phage into the meaning. If people were only this responsive, we would never get the flu. But in a surprising twist, these authors, through some serendipity, learned that antibiotic treatment, so you treat a population with a sub-MIC concentration or minimum inhibitory concentration of antibiotic, also elicits the same behavior causing the swarms of, of microbes not exposed to the antibiotic to be ex- repelled away from the zone of the antibiotic treatment area. This, this sounds like a really great behavior that these organisms have learned how to protect the community as a whole from. Now, this paper oh, wait. get as best best I can tell, this is really news, isn't it? Yes. This phenomenon yes. has never been described before, has it? Not to my knowledge. There not, are not on the population level, but we'll tell this story and then and then they in their yes. discussion they describe a more short term well, uh yes. sense. But so still this paper, it's it certainly is this has escaped most of us. This paper right. explains the mechanism behind this behavior modification of the population, the stressors of antibiotic exposure or mm. phage infections. Now, the authors had a bit of luck in deciphering the mechanism in that they acknowledge the insight offered them having access to a preprint where they learn from an observation from the Lavinge Laboratory of the upregulation of a pseudomonas quorum sensing molecule, PQS, which is an, another long abbreviation for 2 heptyl 3 hydroxyl 4 quinolone. So they just call that PQS in response to being infected, being infected by a phage. Now, quorum sensing. And, and, go ahead, go ahead. Michelle. I think you were about to say um, quorum sensing is signaling externally. So yes. one cell provides information to the others so that they can count how many of us are around. That's the name quorum. And it's not unusual to pseudomonas. This microbe actually has four different and distinct quorum sensing systems that serve in a hierarchical integrated expression network, effectively asking how many of us are here and can we do anything for each other? And it often directs various ex- expression full profiles based on the context of where the organism is. Now, the pseudomonas quinolone signaling molecule, PQS, is secreted by this microbe where it has multiple and diverse roles ranging from cell-to-cell signaling, as Michelle mentioned, being its activity as a quorum molecule, its ability to turn on and off various virulence factors inside the cell, iron acquisition, and its ability to both induce oxidative stress and an antioxidative stress response, and its ability to modulate the host immune response. So we have some inter-kingdom communication as a consequence of this molecule being thrown out for the public good. And now let's add one more magic factor that PQS can do, and that it turns off this swarming behavior in infected cells and actually causes uninfected communities to veer to the left or right, or as I'm going to call it from now on, the ways effect. So here's where Ilio tweaked me today and he said, I want you to sneak in one of my Talmudic questions as people begin to think about this remarkable behavior. And so one of his Talmudic questions that was- Actually, it's not by me. No, it's it's, it's by one of your faithful listeners or readers. Why are the gamma proteobacter, which is effectively where the pseudomonas sit, why are the gamma proteobacter considered the weeds of microbial communities? Now, I would take exception to this and say 
the gamma proteobacter are really driving this tricked out genome where they have all of these tricks available to them hmm. to really adapt to the complex niche like a human host that they find themselves in and they're able to respond. And Elio may want to say something more as we begin to go through this. There are three other quorum sensing factors in Pseudomonas that will play into our discussion here today. But the only thing you need to know about them is that the REL system is involved in the production of this ramnolipid and HAAs that are needed for the swarming activity. So since this quorum system in Pseudomonas, there are four independent systems that are coordinated. You need to appreciate the coordination of these cascading signals that are going on. And it makes the regulation a bit complicated, but just to suffice to say that the REL system is required to make this ramnolipid and these alkanonic acids that are required for the swarming behavior. And our listeners can rest assured that the power of genetics makes this actually very clear. They've got great yes. mutants where they can ask, is this necessary or sufficient, et cetera. Yes, they, they have the delight of being able to make knockouts. And the knockouts they use as part of their controls in many of the experiments that they um, place before us. So these four quorum sensing systems or cross dot networks of signaling systems help to make this microbe such a remarkably versatile pathogen. But at the same time, can I, can I interrupt for a second? Sure. Um, some time ago, a guy in uh, Tel Aviv uh, by the name of Eshel Ben Yaakov invented something he calls the social IQ score of bacteria. <laughs> and, uh, on this, and what he did is he counted how many genes are involved in communication. And Pseudomonas is pretty, has a pretty high social IQ <laughs> seen that way. Hmm. Wow. So that probably increases its versatility. Increases its versatility and its pathogenic potential, which is ultimately where these authors are trying to take us. So in that vein, recall that motility and bioform film formation, namely attachment, are inversely related with both processes being controlled by intracellular levels of dicyclic GMP. Quorum sensing is, is an integral component of this. And other cues such as the stringent response, which is truly a snapshot of the metabolic state of the cell. Now, why does all of the why do all of these variables matter in this discussion? Well, swarming will enable the pseudomonad to move through the mucosal layers within the lung where it has been postulated to contribute to this microbe's ability to resist antibiotic treatment. Mm. Now, the authors go to great pains. There are five sets of experiments in this paper, but I'm only going to do go over three aspects. Uh, Phage-infected colonies can repel uninfected swarms, and phage infection activates the PQ PQS quorum sensing uh, signaling system, and antibiotic stress colonies also repulse swarms. So the thing that we need to appreciate is how they were able to get to this level of detail. So I'm going to explain their one key canonical experiment, if you will, of how they were able to decipher all of this using mutants and other things. Swarming is, again, a group behavior in which cells utilize their flagella with the pili and surfactants, which are these ramnolipids and HAAs, to move as a multicellular group across surfaces where the swarms develop these tendril-like colony morphologies that form from the site of inoculation outward. So considering the bigger picture of what we are going to see here is it's the intersection where stress in the form of a phage infection or an antibiotic exposure can cause the community 
to change directions just as a car avoids a wreck in the middle of the road. So much of the paper hinges on this technique called the swarm assay to observe the behavior of the population. So I would thought I would spend a little bit of time describing how they did their clever experiments. And if so I is, could, Michael, sure, Michelle, um, this would be interject. the time to, to acknowledge that um, one of the authors, Nina Holland Krogsbau um, from Copenhagen, was chatting with this lab, the UC Irvine lab, while they were, the lab was just sitting around a table eating, taking a break, chatting about how they could improve the swarming assay uh, with Nina, who had a lot of experience. And so um, it's, it's a neat example of how communication across groups um, is also really advancing the science. Nina was so excited to learn that um, the paper was being featured in today's episode. She wrote to mm -hmm. say that she has been following TWIM since she switched from cancer biology to microbiology for graduate <laughs> school. And TWIM was her crash course into the exciting world of microbes. So she now recommends the podcasts um, and all the all the the whole series of TWIV podcasts to all of her students. She's an assistant professor now at the University of Copenhagen. So um, she made a great contribution and continues to uh, educate others about the world of TWIM. Nice, thank you. Well, thank you. <laughs> so wonderful. When uh, so the authors cheat a little bit because. The particular phage actually calls an option plane and can become lysogenic. So the authors first isolate a mutant that remains perpetually lytic. So when they infect a lytic, when they use a lytic version of the phage, DMS3, the population uh, repels swarms of uninfected cells. However, this is not due to the presence of phage alone because a cell-free lysate containing active phage fails to repel the swarm. So this is one of their controls. Uh -huh. And instead, cells respond to the phage attack by producing this magic PQS molecule that only becomes apparent to them um, uh, later on. This paper has both the images to convey this Waze effect and they have videos. It's as if you're watching traffic cameras when you're looking at these movies. You literally like see that. the traffic moving away from the phage-infected pseudomonas. You have to watch the movies. It makes the science all that more, much more vivid. Michael, so, so if it's a lysogen, they're not producing the, the molecule and therefore no they are lysogens actually produce it as well so if you but, had a hundred percent lysogen would they repel yes they do but they but so why do they a, make this variant that only lyses the cells they because it's much more predictable okay and then the 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 phage infected cells themselves do not swarm because they're dying is that it well, some are dying, some are not dying, and that's one of the experiments I was going to discuss because it takes a little bit too much time of the, some of the population actually, they turn on the CRISPR-Cas system of Pseudomonas aeruginosa and become resistant is one of their hypotheses to the phage infections. So it, it's trying to dilute some of the CRISPR-Cas, okay. I think, is one of the reasons they're using the lytic the always lytic form of the clinically isolated uh, phage. Got it. But also if um, they sh they stop moving, they reduce the chances of infecting their sieves. Neighbors, yes. So they added this phage to a stationary phage culture that they then spot on this semi-solid auger that they turned the swarming plate, and then they let it grow for 16 to 18 hours. They The the phage they added at a final concentration of uh, 10 to the 12 per mil, which is not enough to cause complete lysis of the community. Uh, they then asked what would happen if the phage infection spreads to neighboring swarming strains. And they did this uh, two ways. They spot one colony to the right that effectively is infected. And then it's the broken car metaphor where it spreads out into the middle. And then they did a clever experiment where they take 
the uninfected Pseudomonas spotted in the middle of the plate and then at what they term satellite positions, what, which I refer to as clock positions of 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 4 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 and 10, they ask what happens. And you can literally see how the satellites are, are able to prevent the swarming behavior of the uninfected uh, center colony that they have um, inoculated. They do a bunch could of could controls. Could you repeat it a little bit, maybe in a shorter way? It's um, a it, just imagine the face of a clock. When, and they place their infected colonies at 2, 4, 6, 8, and 10 o'clock as well as uh, 12. And they ask the question, what happens to the tendrils as they approach those infected cells? And they literally can verify repulsion. They also tested on mutants that fail to make the uh, ramnolipids and HAAs, and they also uh, have the appropriate positive and, and negative controls. So you're able to see how this assay works. And as mentioned earlier, a recent preprint to them gave provided them the necessary insight that suggested the genes required for production of a quorum sensing molecule, PQS, were upregulated in response to that phage infection. And that's effectively what they portray as the aha moment. And they verified that the expression of the genes responsible for the production of PQS, and there's principally two genes that are involved, PQSA and PQSB, were significantly increased in the phage-infected satellite colonies compared to the uninfected center swarm, suggesting that this PQS molecule is indeed involved in the repulsion mechanism that they are seeing. They then investigated where, whether PQS alone induces repulsion of swarms. And indeed, spot, and this is again where you have to understand the value of their satellite assay where they use filter paper and they add increasing concentrations of PQS over the same range of rhamnolipids at the satellite positions and they produce a monotonic increase in repulsion radius akin to more cars blocking the roads across this 12-lane highway in LA. It's as if you have multiple cars broken down so your fan pattern gets wider. And the movie is just exquisite when it, it you're actually able to watch this. Now, because yeah, the, 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 the images on the plate, too, are so much more beautiful than a traffic tie-up. They yes, are gorgeous. <laughs> I can tell you that, yeah. <laughs> and, well, and, Vincent and our first sits author, in traffic most you know, I, I'm every spoiled. Day, every day. I'm spoiled, and Michelle is probably more spoiled because she rides her bike. Right. But um, yep. but our, our first author, Jean-Louis Brew, um, when he first, you know, came into the lab the next morning and saw this amazing pattern where the um, wild type bacteria are migrating out, but they're intentionally avoiding the infected lysed cells. He said it reminded him of the international biohazard sign, which people <laughs> in laboratories will, will recognize yeah. these these big swirls. That's so cool. um, it, it kind of connected that the... Uh, bacteria that are phage infected are sending out their own biohazard sign and creating these beautiful patterns on the auger plates. And then through the magic of genetics, they delete the PQSA gene, which encodes the synthase that produces the early precursor to PQS. And this abolishes swarming of uninfected satellite colonies. So you, you can see the value of the what's actually going on here. They also found that there was more to this than just PQS and that the repulsion 
of the wild type center swarm was significantly decreased in the phage infected delta ramnolipid delta PQS strange, which does not produce the ramnolipids or the HAA. So they need the ramnolipids to. The minus to, or the ram, ramnolipids in the, They the make the plate more slick so it can behave as the not. It's effectively the banging of the ketchup bottle. The ramnolipid is the effect of banging of the ketchup bottle so the community can slide across the plate. It's like oiling your highway. <laughs> yes, it was like oiling the highway, causing a wreck. So the other thing that we know is that PQS is produced during stationary phase. However, the Ways effect is not due to PQS in the inoculum in that sterile filtered supernatant for the deletion mutant delta rel, which means no ramnolipid in the inoculum, did not cause repulsion of the center swarm. And furthermore, the effect is not due to PQS contained within the cells in the inoculum, as sonication and subsequent sterile filtration of the delta rel AB inoculum did not cause repulsion. And collectively, these results then suggested to them that phage infection upregulates PQS production, which is a public good that's thrown out to effectively warn people. And on the le- one of Vincent's twivs that he did after we were done at Georgia Tech, he interviewed a scientist or an economist at Georgia <laughs> Tech who really used a great analogy about public goods and that they're not used up. And what she referred to a public good, it's like a lighthouse. It's effectively showing you that you're approaching a rocky shore and you're not going to be used up. And this public good or PQS is akin to shining a light so that the swarm approaching you knows there are rocks ahead in the form of phage and the whole community of the uninfected literally avoid the rocks on the shoal because the PQS is out there. The PQS is diffusing into the uninfected cells and having its uh, effect on it. So the next experiment is that the antibiotic stress colonies also repulse storm, uh, swarms. So antibiotic stress also increases PQS signaling. So you can get the idea that PQS is promoting survival of the fittest cells even within these heterogeneous pseudomonas populations by sensitizing the cells to the fact that there's oxidative stress coming or other stressors like death via phage or death via an antibiotic. So to test this very fascinating hypothesis, they use the application of cell stress through the exposure to antibiotics to ask the question, will this also direct spatial organization of the population to move it away from an antibiotic infected, antibiotic I guess I want to use the word infected, but it's not an antibiotic exposed colony. So again, to test the hypothesis, wild type Pseudomonas aeruginosa is mixed with gentamicin, which inhibits growth through the stalling of ribosomal tRNA translocation, whereupon it was immediately spot, spotted at satellite positions. And first, there's very little growth in the antibiotic exposed cells, which highlights that they were providing the gentamicin below the MIC level, which occurs as a consequence of diffusion. So as the gentamicin diffuses out, the MIC further drops down, you get the growth. And the slow growth of the antibiotic treated pseudomonas in pseudomonas exposed cells was phenotypically comparable to that due to a phage infection. So here's where it's really good to look at 
figure four and figure two, compare the two of them, or movie five and movie um, two, and you can see that they look equivalent. This behavior of swarm repulsion looks equivalent. Now, the swarm repulsion was not due to the presence of gentamicin alone, as untreated swarms can pass through Pseudomonas aeruginosa free gentamicin spots, and gentamicin induced swarms repulsion was observed in the Delta Rel AB strain. So they really go to great lengths to drive home this fact. And in fact, yeah, they and that, that was a key control to show that the genomycin yes. wasn't just killing bacteria yes. that approached. Yes, it wasn't knocking them out. And mm-hmm. and they go and that's the beauty of doing this on a petri plate because you're you're effectively continuously diluting the drug because it's on the filter paper and the agar is sucking it away. This is something that you could not do in a liquid culture per se, because the concentration would be uniform throughout the liquid. But in the agar matrix, it's a uh, inverse square law. You put it down and then time is coordinating the diffusion of the antibiotic away from uh, the infected colony. I'm, so I'm, uh, I'm wondering what other conditions would repel. We've looked at infection. We've looked at antibiotic treatment. Do you think starvation would be another one that would say I stay think, away? I think starvation would be another one, that there are no nutrients here. This yeah, is yeah, right. you know, bad pasture land, so to speak. I wonder if, Michelle, an immune cell engulfing them, if that would mm-hmm. Ha- mm-hmm. cause them to say, mm-hmm. stay away. <laughs> All these things are testable, right? Yeah. Yeah. If, if the immune cell, like a neutrophil, if it was puncturing the bacterial cell and having it just spew out its content, that probably would do it. Hmm. So what you cannot forget, though, is that this PQS molecule is a public good item. And again, the lighthouse metaphor and shining a light on the region that the uninfected or unexposed community is approaching. And they did this experiment, and they, again, used a sophisticated assay. They used mass spectrometry, mass spectroscopy uh, to analyze the agar extracts in the zone of repulsion outside of the antibiotic-treated uh, satellite colonies. And the PQS is actually diffusing away. And again, it drives home the importance of public goods and advancing the fitness of this community because an infection is not a single cell. It's a community effect and indicates that the induction of stress, either through the inhibition of tRNA translocation or cell wall synthesis, inhibits swarmy motility and induces this long-range dispersion of the PQS molecule, which repulses swarms from entering the area containing the stress-inducing agent, thus of being able to avoid the rocks. Now, I'm curious. I'm curious whether PQS can be sensed by other species that are related. Uh, hmm. That was the question that we had before you came on today. Hmm. Is we know that quorum sensing is not very particular in the well, gram cer- negative. certain molecules are species specific, but then other auto inducers um, are, are more not. generalists. So, so I, the, I'm not. I didn't do my homework, so I don't know whether PQS is specific to the Pseudomonas or not. I, I don't know. You, the, you could argue the, it both ways because if if um, you wouldn't necessarily want E. coli to come uh, in, and if they could be infected by the same phage, because then the phage would be amplified and put the other Pseudomonas in the vicinity at risk. So it might be an occasion to protect all comers. But it also you could do it with the antibiotic because the antibiotic, since PQS comes out secondary to antibiotic exposure you could see whether or not it would repulse uh, in E. coli or more, or another right. organism that swarms readily as Proteus vulgaris. So 
Now, the really neat experiment is, and this is the final experiment I'm going to talk about, is they ask the question, what's going on with res with respect to PQS-mediated repulsion in response to this really nasty epidemic strain that was recovered from a Liverpool epidemic. Now, this strain is a hypervirulent isolate of Pseudomonas aeruginosa. So again, this strain is spotted without antibiotics or exposure to phage at the satellite positions at 2 through 12. And the wild type Pseudomonas is spotted in the middle, a ways experiment, if you will. The Liverpool isolates grew slowly. They didn't swarm akin to it's already being stressed out. So the microbe, even absent phage or antibiotics, it's actually repulsing the wild type PA14. So the Liverpool hypervirulent isolate seems to be amped up on stress already in absence of So this of is even without the phage or the antibiotic stress. Yes. They're naturally pushing away. They're cool. naturally, and this is a hypervirulent strain. So this is the strain I would use to ask some of Michelle's questions. Would this repel an E. coli? Would this repel a proteus? Would this repel immune cells? What, what immune cells will do? Now, they also asked a similar question for a mucoid variant of Pseudomonas aeruginosa that was specifically recovered from a cystic fibrosis isolate. And again, the center swarms, tendrils contacted untreated satellite colonies, but were repulsed by antibiotic-treated mucoid variants. So the stress response matters in a clinical situation, and that's the stress response is present in clinical isolates and suggests a role for the stress response in directing pathogenesis and maybe even treatment tolerance. So putting this all together, this paper is about how bacterial communities respond to stimuli. And in this case, the stimulus is a stressor, whether it be exposure to a phage infection or antibiotics. So when the community perceives stress, it upregulates this PQS molecule, which they toss out for the good of the community. And this quorum molecule is not used up. It just diffuses a way to warn the neighborhood that things aren't good, like a lighthouse serving to warn other boats that the shore is rocky and to stay clear. And so it's governed by the diffusion kinetic. What's most remarkable is that the stress population can warn off a healthy community. If you will, this is interpopulational signaling, leading me to wonder, which Michelle wondered earlier, to whether or not this serves the species, the microbiome, or even pathogenesis. And it, it again, as I'm teaching medical students this semester, it drives home the fact Infections are no longer just bugs and drugs or treat and street. You really have to understand all this remarkable biology that these organisms have adapted over time. So this paper is, is one that I would recommend to an undergraduate audience to, to read through because, you know, it's it's pretty straightforward. It introduces them to some microbial genetics and phage biology, and you can actually see how these the swarmy behavior works, and, and you learn a little bit about pathogenesis. So, so speaking it, of pathogenesis, I don't think any of this tells us whether this happens in an animal or not. You know, The you, only you, thing you, is, using, is the mute, is yeah, the, the strain, mucoid strain. But I would say, okay, what if this is an assay that works on a plate? Yeah, so the the virulent strain does the same thing. How could you set up an experiment to ask whether there's this public good produced to warn away other bacteria in a mouse, say? That would be that would really be cool if you could do that. 
Well, their argument is that um, the soft auger or the semi-solid auger it, in being a non-Newtonian solid is very similar to the mucosal surfaces. Sure, but it's not a mucosal surface, right? That is correct. You want, you want to they're, see this. They're making you make the leap. <laughs> if you want an R01 to do you this, gotta have you've got to have an model. animal model. <laughs> That's right, Vincent. So I don't know how to do that because if you just knock out PQS production, it's going to have uh, multi-phenotypic effects, and whatever happens in the animal wouldn't be relevant. You somehow have to design a experiment, a way of, and, I, and I don't know how to do it. Well, I, could you put a filter paper disc that would allow the PQS to diffuse away from the mucosal surface and see if the infection would proceed towards it? Maybe. Yeah, you'd have to do something fun. You'd have to like implant that, yeah. it in one of these little Osmo pumps. Maybe. Anyway, I think that's a important consideration. I, I think a plaque assay ought to be applied to this question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> <laughs> you could quantify spread of the phage as a surrogate for. Um, well, you know, you know, if you do this in a lung, the, the hypothesis is that the presence of a phage-infected focus will repel other uninfected bacteria and there's got to be a way that you could set that up yeah and yeah. luckily pseudomonas does makes you know wound infections all it's very promiscuous so you could possibly set it up in a burn wound maybe model. maybe yeah. And, yeah but really beautiful I, work i want to i want to add something to all this <laughs> uh to me and i guess it's been said already <clears throat> the finding that stressed bacteria Tell non-stressed bacteria, watch out. There's a stress coming your way. It's absolutely amazing. This, to me, is a revelation. It's like yeah. something I never would have guessed. And it's it's over a, a distance, too, which is very cool. Yeah, that's right. Now, it's over a distance. To and the author's like Michael, credit. Like Michael says, they, it's, like a whiz. it's like a ways signal. But it's, it's truly remarkable. I, I never thought about this. Can't say that I did. I can. If I had thought about it, I would never have come up with this. It seems most unlikely, and here it is. So the authors do point out that Pseudomonas also has a more short-range defense mechanism that they share with other cells, and this was published um, by a group from University of Washington and University of Maryland in eLife in 2015, where if cells are lysed, they can then um, respond to that damage and change their biology to protect um, cells that are in contact with them. So it's a much more short-range uh, mm -hmm. defense. I, I missed that completely, so mm -hmm. that's why I'm so surprised. <laughs> yeah, no, well, this is a long range. This is a completely different pathway, that's but true. it's kind of part of the bag of tricks of protecting uh, neighbors. Yeah, so it makes bacteria much more sophisticated than the Oh, reason. yeah, or like yeah, it's amazing. <laughs> so so this work was led by Jean-Louis Brew, who is a, a PhD student in the lab of Albert Syrup, Syruporn. And he was born in Paris, France. His parents are Vietnamese, and he describes growing up as a Vietnamese minority in a poor suburb of Paris where he didn't feel he had an access to... Uh, education um, because he didn't have the um, the best education and it's more competitive there. But he said when he was 16 years old, his parents made the decision to move the family to California. And that, he felt, gave him this opportunity to have access to um, more education. So he, after getting his um, undergraduate degree at UC Irvine, he then start, or I'm sorry, after getting his high school degree, he then started at a community college in the area and then transferred into UC Irvine and got a bachelor's degree in <clears throat> molecular biology and biochemistry. Now, all the, all this while, his parents were informing him that the most um, safe guaranteed path to success and stability was as a doctor or an engineer or a, a lawyer. And so they were encouraging him to build off his science interests and go to medical school. And he thought that's what he would do, but realized that 
science is what really got him excited. And he, as a kid, for example, he loved watching science shows on TV. That was one of his main hobbies. He still does that with YouTube. And so he just decided that he was going to convince his parents that he should go to graduate school instead of medical school. And this was a bit of a struggle, but um, he did it. And uh, described to his parents that he wanted to become a professor who could guide future generations of students to choose a career path that that excited them and would also give them satisfaction rather than just uh, safety. So that's his his goal in life is to focus on student mentorship and help others uh, grow and find meaning in life. Now, he is um, living that um, even as he's doing this beautiful work. He's also taken a leadership opportunity. He's got he's the internal vice president of the Union of Vietnamese Student Associations um, at UC Irvine. And their mission is to encourage other students to uh, pursue a career in STEM. And he's especially motivated because he points out that um, Vietnamese um, obtain uh, college degrees at about half the rate of other Asian Americans. So he wants to really get in and inspire uh, the next generation so that they can think more broadly and just be more aware of the opportunities for uh, science majors. So um, that's a really neat story. He also uh, wanted to credit um, one of his colleagues, Brendan Rawson, who was um, an undergraduate and studying physics, who really started this um, project. And his motivation was to understand what dictates how far bacteriophage can spread through a bacterial population. So he credits him with uh, launching the project. He ha does have um, advice for junior colleagues. He says, if you're a STEM major, don't limit yourself to a career that others decide perhaps family or um, the community. Instead, um, figure out where your passions are and follow those. He says going to graduate school has been the most rewarding decision of his life. He especially loves mentoring undergraduates and seeing how they progress in their own development. Um, it reminds him of how he used to struggle, but has now overcome some of those same challenges. And he feels that by sharing his personal experience, he can uh, be a role model and really inspire um, other uh, students and in particular uh, members of minority communities, and especially uh, Vietnamese uh, students to really think broadly about uh, a career in science. So he says, get ready to learn, improve, and succeed in graduate school. You will not regret taking that path. <laughs> <laughs> having, having had a similar path myself, having gone to medical school for a while, giving it up, mm -hmm. and then coming to this country to get a PhD, uh, let me just bear witness to the fact that the attitude of his parents about uh, getting a degree in law or engineering or medicine is not an anti-intellectual thing. It's simply based on the fact that getting a PhD is an unknown quantity for people living in yeah. Vietnam. This just doesn't happen. It's not well, something yeah, you run I, into. I grew up. I grew up in small towns in the Midwest, but because I was a field hockey player and Title IX uh, was being enforced, I was recruited hey. to play field hockey in the Ivy League. Um, but even then. I remember a conversation with my parents um, talking about graduate school, and they'd ask this, the typical question, well, how much longer are you going to be in graduate school? <laughs> and I said, well, you know, typically here at Harvard, it's, you know, five or six years. My dad says, five or six years? You could have gone to medical school in that amount of time. <laughs> yep. Yes. Sure. It's the question so, every graduate student is going to be asked on Thursday afternoon during dinner. When are you defending? <laughs> yes. Yep. Yes. Just you, stick you, to your uh, guns, folks. Got to stick to your guns. It's a good story. That's it. Well, and we all have to do a better job of explaining uh, the excitement yeah. and the rewards and the opportunities um, of careers in research. And if you want to not do research, listen to TWIV 574, the How Economics Drive Science, which, I, as Michael mentioned, I did with Paula Steffen down at Georgia State. And, uh, you might think otherwise. Pretty, I listened to that grim. podcast this week, <laughs> this weekend, and was mesmerized by some of the things that she was saying. And I'm actually living some of the things that she's describing about the way medical schools are behaving 
and how they're risk adverse. Yep. Go read the, read the book, Michael. You'll love it. I ordered it uh, Saturday afternoon, so it should be here today. Yeah, it's really good. Paula Stefan, good stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Sean Louis. Yes. <laughs> yes, John Louis, good job. I have to say that Brew, I don't know if he knows this, but Brew uh, is the name of an HIV isolate. <laughs> BRU? Probably isolated from oh. France. BRU, it is. It was from. I mean, uh, that's. Uh, it's why it's maybe is a common name. I don't know. Anyway, that is Twim210. You can find it on your podcast player. If you do listen on a phone or tablet, please subscribe so you get every episode. And we know how many of you are listening. That helps us a lot in our efforts to raise money to support the show. Uh, if you want to see the links to the papers, and this week, a picture of a bone with a piece of copper wrapped around it. Go to microbe.tv slash twim for our show notes. If you really like what we do, consider supporting us. Go to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have ways like Patreon and PayPal where you could give as little as a dollar a month and really make a difference. We'd appreciate that very much. And, of course, questions and comments, twim at microbe.tv. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you all. It's nice to be with the four of you, or have the four of us together again. Yes. Elio Schechter is at Small Things Considered. Thank you, Elio. I second that. It's really fun. This was a good one. Michael Schmitz at the Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank ASM for their support. And Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIM was edited by Ray Ortega. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 